Romans 10. 10 to 1 Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is, that they might be saved. We begin this chapter by Paul sharing his heart's desire. Just because somebody has a desire, that doesn't mean it will happen. Some people may want to shout that Jesus, said if you ask anything in my name I will do it. That is true. However, the scripture also teaches that we must pray according to his will. You have to put both passages together to get the correct understanding. We are to only pray according to God's will and not according to our wants. Also, what do you do with those passages in the Bible where God tells a prophet not to pray for Israel because he will not hear it? What do you do with that Mr. O or Mrs. Name it and claim it? I'll tell you what they do with those passages. They ignore them and don't even touch them. 10 to 2 For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Interesting because knowledge is key to understanding God. Yet all these airhead Judaizers want to claim that God is mysterious. No he is not. It is true that some of his ways are not able to be understood. But God's word is easy to be understood. That is if you have a King James Bible and the Holy Spirit. Also ironic that he mentions that they have zeal for God, but without the knowledge. What knowledge? Of his perfected word, text. It's amazing how many of these people believe doctrines and beliefs that are not found anywhere in his word. That is why Judaizers are lost and going straight to hell. 10 to 3 For they being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. That is the main problem with mainstream religion of the world. Ignorant of God's righteousness, as described and explained clearly in the King James Bible perfected text. Also they are very busy to establish their own righteousness in the flesh, which is as filthy rags according to the book of Isaiah. That is why people cannot understand scripture or doctrine. They don't search the scripture. Rather, they are much rather search the sages, Talmud, originals they've never seen, Hebrew or Greek, lexicons, commentaries, multiple Bible versions, teachers, pastors, etc. Lastly, you cannot submit yourself to the righteousness of God if you are ignorant about his righteousness. So unless you're reading the King James Bible perfected text, you are not going to understand God's righteousness completely. By using many other versions of the Bible, and the others I've listed, ignorance will be part of your faith and walk with a God that you don't know much about. 10 to 4 For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to every one that believeth. You have to let the context speak for itself. Otherwise, you're guilty of picking and choosing certain texts and running with them, like all cults do. Context. See verses 5 to 10. Just paraphrasing the simple message. Paul is basically giving the understanding that there is a righteousness of the law. But as proven before, 930-33, the children of Israel died because they sought it not by faith. So Paul is explaining, as James does that faith without works is dead, James 2, that the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ our Lord by faith, is the beginning of our walk. Then the righteousness of the law comes afterwards. When it says Christ is the end of the law, it means what it says. Notice it does not say, for Christ is the end of the law, in that it ceased, for righteousness to every one that believeth. Nor does it say, for Christ was the end of the law. Lastly, Christ is the beginning and the end. See Ecclesiastes 3 11, 7 8, Hebrews 12 2, Revelation 1 8, 21 6, 22 13. 10 5 For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. He says the present tense word is. He did not say the righteousness which was of the law. So if the moral law is done away in Christ, then why did Paul write this in the present tense? Then he quotes Lev 18 to 5. The context of chapter 18 is the moral law, dealing with sexual sins. 
It is true that we are not bound to the ceremonial Levitical priesthood anymore. But that does not mean that we have the liberty in Christ to break the moral law. But I've heard some people say, there is no such thing as the moral law or ceremonial law. Then my challenge to them is, how do you know what laws we can do and what laws we can't do? I bet you they can't even explain that one. But I've heard them try to explain that we are not in Israel so we can't do those laws. Well the problem with that stupid reasoning, is that all the law was given in Israel. So if you're going to use that excuse, then we might as well throw out the Ten Commandments too. So we can break all those commandments because we're not in Israel. Are they really that mentally depraved and deluded? Just because the terms moral law or ceremonial law do not occur in scripture, doesn't mean they cannot be used for explanation. Just like the word, Trinity. That's not in scripture. So according to their stupidity the Trinity doesn't exist. Only a low IQ unenlightened halfwit would conclude such a thing. 10 to 6 But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven. That is, to bring Christ down from above, 10 to 7 Or, who shall descend into the deep. That is, to bring up Christ again from the dead, again he uses the word is. So there is righteousness of the law and there is righteousness of faith. If the law does not apply anymore, then Paul is really stupid and doesn't have any grammatical education. So his teachers in school really were not that intelligent. Paul is referencing to Pro 30-4. He is elaborating on the faith in Christ. Without faith in Christ, nothing else in life matters or has value. That was Israel's problem. They did not believe on Christ, but solely trusted in the law. That was why, according to chapter 9, they all died. 10 to 8 But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth, and in thy heart, that is, the word of faith, which we preach, but what saith it? He's asking a question regarding scripture. Remember, scripture is neither gender, masculine or feminine. It's an IT. If God does not breathe into it, it has no power. Then he references Jude 30:14. Now there are many people who are critics of the King James Bible. They make accusations like the translators misquoted the Old Testament verse. But nowhere in this verse did Paul say, it is written. He cannot be misquoting something, unless he gives the exact reference of what he is referring to. Also the New Testament was written in Greek. So if you translate from one language to another there will be different sentence structure, punctuation, and word order. So it is completely erroneous and irresponsible to accuse somebody of misquotation when they are translating. That's like if you have an interpreter for a missionary in Spain. And when he translates one of the preacher's sentences, the preacher quickly accuses him of misquoting him. Just as stupid. That is, the word of faith, which we preach, this last part of the verse Paul claims that this is the word of faith he is talking about. Regardless of what anybody says or writes, you have to have faith in what they write or speak to believe it. The Old Testament, was fulfilled through Christ. This is the sole purpose of the New Testament being written. To explain in detail what Christ fulfilled and how. 10-9 That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. What is he preaching? The truth of believing on Jesus Christ to be saved. Paul says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in his resurrection, you will be saved. This is a key verse people claim that there are no laws to keep to be saved. Believing on him is all that is required. The problem is, what are you saved from? You are saved from your past through faith by believing on Jesus Christ as Lord and his resurrection. That's where your faith begins because it is given to you by God through the word of God. Since he is the beginning and end of our faith, then that is what has saved us from our past and it will be what saves us in the end. 
But as explained thoroughly before, if you really believe on someone you will do what they say. 1010 For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. 1011 For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. We first believed from the heart on Christ. Then we make confession with our mouth because we are not ashamed of it. If you truly believe something, you won't be ashamed to proclaim it at the appropriate time. People who shy away from proclaiming the truth of God when they are asked about it, then they are ashamed of it because they are embarrassed to speak of it. 10.12 For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. He says there is no difference between the Jew and Greek, or Gentile. Basically all who are not Jews by blood are Gentiles. Again as explained before, there are two different kinds of Gentiles, believers and unbelievers. The same with Jews, born by blood and Jews of the heart, which is what the Church is. 10.13 For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Gospel is open to all. Also again we are saved by calling on the Lord from our past. There is nothing we can do to atone for our past, except to believe on the Lord and the Gospel. 10.14 How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Three questions that Paul asks based on logical sense. 1. They cannot call on someone if they don't believe him. 2. Secondly they cannot believe on somebody if they haven't heard of him or the gospel. 3. And they cannot hear about the gospel without a preacher. All three points are inseparable. That's why Christ said for us to preach the gospel. He set the example by doing it during his earthly ministry. Now he leaves the job to us. 10.15 And how shall they preach, except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace, and bring glad tidings of good things. People have to be sent to preach. All of us are preachers to a point. That's why the scripture talks about being prepared to have an answer to them to ask us of the hope that is in us. He talks about preaching the gospel of peace and bringing glad tidings of good things. The gospel of Jesus Christ will bring peace to people if they accept it. But it will bring prosecuted wrath from God if they don't accept it. 10.16 But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Esaias saith, Lord, who hath believed our report. So the gospel of Jesus Christ was preached in the Old Testament. It was preached as a prophecy, but it was not offered yet. The they is Israel. They have not obeyed the gospel. And they did not obey it again when Christ appeared. 1017 So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Faith can only come from God when you hear his word. Not somebody singing a solo in church, or a choir number, or preaching from the pulpit. But it's hearing the word of God, now you might ask well what if I'm deaf? Then you can hear with your eyes by sign language. 10.18 But I say, have they not heard? Yes verily, their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. This is proof that the Great Commission was completed by the Apostles and Prophets. It says all the earth and ends of the earth. And no, that does not prove the world is flat. So pastors have no business putting a lecture yoke upon their congregations telling them that they need to get the Great Commission done, as though it's not being done. In that case, this pastor must not know much about his Bible, and must have been soaking his airhead noggin in Greek lexicons and dead languages. 1019 But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. God said that he would provoke Israel to jealousy by a people that are not his. And by a foolish nation he will anger the Jews. That's why the Jews wanted to kill the apostles and the early church. Because they were the choice God made through his Son. 
it's interesting that he will make the Jews jealous by him choosing another people. So the Jews would have to be grafted into with the church to be accepted. If somebody is jealous they will move from where they are at and move towards what they are envious of. 1020 But Esaias is very bold, and saith, I was found of them that sought me not, I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. This is why he said that no man seeks after God because they don't know how to seek after him and holiness. God is found a people that do not seek him because God first reveals himself to them. He makes the first move. That's why the scripture says that he first loved us by sending his son to die for the world. 1021 But to Israel he saith, All day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. Again when he says Israel he is meaning the Israelites of the flesh. Not according to the promise of Abraham through Isaac. It was the backslidden sinful Israel that he did everything within his power to convince the Israelites to follow his ways. But they chose not to.